Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lily. I am the president of Solana Foundation. Um, I got into crypto when it was only Bitcoin back in 2013 and 2014. Ten years later, uh, I still always remember some of the original things that brought me to Bitcoin and into blockchain. And one of the things that really uh, got me excited about blockchain and what Bitcoin could possibly do was this original vision of programmable money. Uh, so uh, for me, you know, I got into this because of Bitcoin. I'm part of the Solana ecosystem today, part of the Solana Foundation. Uh, but to me, uh, these are still parts of an overall kind of industry and a mission that we're all on um, to uh, broaden financial access uh, and really reinvent uh, the internet of money. All right, so what is the original vision for blockchain? Well, it's actually on the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, the uh, title of the Bitcoin white paper is a peer-to-peer -peer electron electronic cash system. It's not Bitcoin uh, digital gold for the next century or something like that, right? So what did Bitcoin sort of propose, not just literally what's in the white paper, but what was kind of the vision and why it becomes significant? Well, it started off with a technical mechanism uh, that allows uh, algorithmic uh, uh, kind of protection of digital property rights through self-custody. So this is uh, an image of the original Bitcoin Genesis wallet. And the reason why this becomes uh, significant is with self-custody, you can have digital property rights in an increasingly digital world. Also what it means is that with the advent in 2015 of smart contracts and what Ethereum brought to the blockchain space, then you could have programmable money and with programmable money, uh, kind of money Legos type of articulation, uh, you, could start to start, you could start building an open financial system where anyone with an internet connection can access self-custody and therefore can tap into an open financial system. There go, ergo, everyone with, a, uh, with an internet connection has a bank account, right? Uh, we've probably all used these things in the past. Etherscan, you've probably done a swap or done something in DeFi on chain. Uh, and it's amazing, it's transformative. There's just a couple of things that actually do limit financial access, which is that on a really important day, if you're gonna swap, it could cost you $800. That's, uh, and that's something that you can afford if you're a whale and trading a million dollars. Okay, fine, that, that is what it is. But if you are a regular person trying to use DeFi, that's prohibitive. Uh, and furthermore, why this is important is because with self-custody, being able to access an open financial system, uh, what that now puts in the hands of basically anyone with an internet connection is access to economic sovereignty. And economic sovereignty itself is important because economic sovereignty is the basis for greater forms of self-sovereignty. And as so many things in this world have moved into the digital realm, uh, being able to actually own something in a digitally native environment is critical. And this is not something that you know, only even came around with Bitcoin in 2008. Uh, if anyone's ever read this book, I consider this book to be really required reading in blockchain. Uh, there's kind of like this 20 page section, it's really a blueprint for Bitcoin. And just to read you one of many choice uh, passages in there, uh, new technologies will allow, the, uh, will allow the holders of wealth to bypass the national monopolies that issued and regulated money in the modern period. Uh, and uh, the importance of controlling the world's wealth will be transcended by mathematical algorithms that have no physical existence. Sound familiar, right? So, uh, all right, so going back to kind of what the original Bitcoin story was and how this evolved over time. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was a lot of discourse, a lot of open discourse over what exactly is Bitcoin, which at the time was really analogous for really this entire concept of what blockchains were. So there's a lot of discourse, is it store of value, is it a medium exchange, or is it really a technology platform? And if you look back about eight to 10 years, there was a lot of discussion around this and different parts of the industry, the core devs, the app builders, the investors had different perspectives on this. Today, we take it for given that what Bitcoin became was digital gold. Um, that affected the robot, meaning the idea that there should not really be a technology roadmap for Bitcoin because Bitcoin is not a technology platform. Okay, uh, it's doing great. We all love Bitcoin. Uh, but then the question is, these two other things, 
are also important, and so who's doing something about this? Video exchange technology platform. In my mind, everyone that came after Bitcoin, including Ethereum, including Solana, including many, many others, are really focused on building out this vision. Pretty different than trying to be digital gold, and no one else gets to be digital gold. Okay. So uh, following the original kind of vision of Bitcoin, now there were some early innovators on talking about blockchains for payments. Bitcoin itself also talked about perhaps Bitcoin for payments. Uh, but then the narrative around this has been, well, if you put payments on a blockchain, it's better because value proposition is fat, cheap, and constant. Uh, the issue that I have with this value proposition is I think it's not good enough. I think that whenever you have new technologies, those technologies have to enable new markets. It's not just about taking the thing that you do today and putting it on a new platform in the same way that about 30 years ago, when, uh, when you know, Web1 came about, and we were all chatting with our friends on AIM, a lot of folks thought, you know, over 90% of the folks thought that for sure Time Warner was going to own the internet because we're just going to take all of that content and we're going to, take, we're going to put the newspaper online because it's faster, cheaper, and constant, right? So we always have this narrative, okay, this new technology is going to make that other thing that we already do fast, cheap, and constant, but it never actually really works out like that because what technologies really are here to do is to reveal, organize, and monetize long-tail markets. So going back to the content example, back on Web1, we were all using Blogger, and that was really the advent of what was creating, revealing this long-tail market around content creators and con content consumers, which is all of us. Similarly, Uber or Grab here in Singapore, uh, there's always been latent demand for drivers and riders at any moment, and with new technology, meaning mobile phone, you could actually start to reveal and monetize those markets. Uh, so what do we learn from that, and how do we apply that towards Bitcoin, blockchain, and kind of the future of our industry? Uh, so in my mind, to summarize, new technologies have to be anchored and really sort of can gain adoption on 10x use cases. Fast, cheap, and constant is good, it's just not good enough. All right, so then the question has been, well, if this has been the vision of Bitcoin all along, why haven't we gotten there 15 years later? Um, well, in my mind, it's because you have to have three things in the same place at the same time. Performance, again, a lot of people like to talk about fast and cheap. You know, well, uh, you've probably seen this about Solana before. Fast block times and then doing popular things like minting NFTs, also very performant. Capital liquidity, this is an important one. You can have a really fast blockchain, but if no one uses it, then it's not useful. So asset liquidity has, over the years, come into our industry, largely in the form of stable coins, because that is the money that people actually use for everyday life, so medium exchange. And then lastly, developers. One of the hardest things to build after the blockchain network itself, there are two ecosystems with critical mass of independent developer bases. One is clearly EVM, the one that started it all. The second is Solana. So three conditions, you've got to have all three of these things in the same place at the same time. Said more simply, the chain itself has to be fast and cheap, performant. You've got to have critical mass and money that people use, and you've got to have independent developers. And also importantly, you cannot see this as a trilemma. I know we've gotten used to the narrative that everything is a trilemma. If you are only two out of these three, which I think is the current state, then you will never actually be able to build an on-chain economy because you're forced to trade off performance and liquidity unification, which doesn't work for financial products. Okay, so what is PayFi? Isn't PayFi just DeFi? Uh, well, it's not because the way we talk about DeFi today, it's a trade. The core unit is I send in a token and I get another token back. Whereas when you're talking about payments and settlements, the core transaction is you're, you're sending in a token and you're get a, getting a good or service back. And that's a fundamentally different type of transaction. Uh, and what it also means uh, is that a settlement for a good or service, inherently there's a production value behind that transaction, which means that there's a time value of money with each one of these settlements. Okay, so here I'm just gonna share three examples of the types of things you could do that you can only do on blockchains. Uh, and you know, what's interesting about these is that the kind of core demand for these types of transactions already exists. They just cannot exist in real time uh, at the microtransaction value that you can potentially do on blockchain. All right, so one retail example first. Uh, we've all heard of buy now, pay later, Klarna, Affirm. Uh, what you could do in blockchain is buy now, pay never. All right, so how would that work? Well, today, 
Uh, everyone likes to talk about paying for coffee with crypto. You could buy, buy a cup of coffee, let's call that $5, and maybe the credit card company or someone in between goes and actually pays that $5 to the merchant. Instead of actually paying the $5 in cash or whatever it might be, or $5 at the end of the month in your credit card bill, you could take $50 and put it into a lend borrow, for example, Camino, and the interest from that, the yield from that, could be streamed as a repayment on the $5 that, of coffee that you just consumed. Now, you could put in $50 into lend borrow, you could put in $5,000, and depending on how much you put in, the interest level will, of course, be different. Uh, you'd pay it off sooner rather than later. So this is one of the ways that composable finance in crypto, programmable money and composable finance become useful because it starts to collapse payments and savings and investments. A second example uh, is so crypto or uh, uh, internet native producers, creators, typically sole proprietors. And uh, if you spoke with a creator, they'd probably be thrilled to be able to finance a video today, and let's say a million view videos worth $10,000 over time, they'd gladly take $9,000 today, finance their next production, but this is a type of credit market that cannot exist today, does not exist today for a number of different reasons, uh, partially because the creator business is too small to, uh, to finance a single asset at that asset. It's just, it doesn't make sense and it's not economic, right? These are the types of economies and the types of credit markets that could potentially be created in a digitally native world where the asset, the collateral, the payment, and sort of the entire economic loop can be done online. The third, APAR financing. Massive industry, um, I owe a supplier $100,000, that supplier might take $95,000 today rather than 100 k in a month, right, uh, to ease their own working capital requirements. The thing is, in order to access this market, you've probably got to be uh, both in the United States in a, in, or, or you know, in a very well-developed economy, have three years of audited financial statements, have a great relationship with your banker, and finance some critical mass of your business. If you wanted to do, if you don't fulfill all four of those requirements, you basically don't have access to this market, and this is something tons of supply and demand, both on the capital side and also the business side. So three examples, um, and here are some ways where this can actually be architected, you're really using the tools we already use in crypto today. Payment processing. Payment processors typically fulfill three functions because it's sort of vertically integrated on this chart where you're, you have the KYC, uh, they manage the KYC, they also manage the movement of funds, let's say cross-border minimum of three days, so you've got to trust that they're actually using your capital to bridge that transaction, and they also manage pay and pay out. So if you could use some of the tools that we already are very mature in crypto today to, uh, to parcel these out, so they manage the KYC, liquidity can be managed on-chain, which allows uh, which potentially broadens uh, uh, liquidity to new sources of liquidity, and it's also transparent because it is on-chain, uses all the stable coins that are critical mass today, and then also you can use the blockchain to manage pay and pay out addresses with stable coins. Then you can bring both creator transparency, velocity, and also really just utility to something as mundane and as sort of as frequently used as payment processing. Then you can extend this and the kind of the, the on-ramp KYC evaluator, maybe that person is a originating credit. Some of this is already happening online, uh, uh, on-chain in kind of various contexts, but this is the way you can evolve from payment processing to credit origination models and increasingly sort of new forms of credit and on-chain activity. Uh, and this applies to really any, anywhere in the kind of value chain that you have, a time value of money, which is all of these different kind of products that we already know use and exist throughout the world, supply chain finance, payday loans, credit cards, cross-border settlement, interbank repo markets, uh, and I think these are all really right on, uh, right on the horizon for us as an industry and are uniquely possible on Solana because this is the only environment where you've got performance and liquidity both in capital as well as talent. So that's what I want to share about PayFi. Um, we're building this. We had Several thousand people uh, applied to come to our PayFi Summit yesterday, um, had a full house, and so this is uh, uh, come join the PayFi movement. Thanks so much.